to Empowered. We are excited to be launching our first episode with Dr. Alvin Sanders, President and CEO of World Impact. He is speaking to a group of local church leaders in Wichita, Kansas. This is a unique episode as he is speaking in front of a live audience. He refers a lot of times to a PowerPoint presentation. If you are just listening to the audio only version, you can find a PDF version in the description of this episode. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming to this workshop. This workshop is called Leading Towards a Legacy. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to engage you on what I believe is what may be one of the, the most difficult problems within urban communities today. It's probably not what you think it is, but I think it's a crisis in leadership. And so to begin, you know, we're just coming off of Father's Day. Believe it or not, that's not a picture of me. That's a picture of my father and my mother at their wedding in 1968. The first time I saw that picture, I about fainted because I thought I saw a clone or a ghost or something like that. My dad could not deny me if he wanted to. <laughs> I think y'all can see there's no DNA test needed, right? That is my father. And also, if I showed you a picture of my little sister, that is my little sister. So that's what we're going to talk about today. It's about leaving a legacy. What does a, how do you build a, a leadership development program within your church that it could run without you, which may scare some of you. But really, the thing that you have to wrap your mind around is whatever ministry that you're leading, you will not lead it eternally. You are replaceable. How humbling is that? So I think every pastor, every ministry leader should definitely try to build their ministry in a way in which it can function without them because there will be a time where you won't be there anymore, whether God calls you on to another assignment or whether God calls you through retirement or whatever it may be, there will come a point where you're not there yet. So the question becomes, how do we lead in leaving a legacy? Now, here's a, here's a, uh, a problem, right? It's called a domino effect. And that poor man sitting in that chair has started something in motion that he has no idea that's going to eventually collapse on top of him. And I believe that's the, the issue, the major issue in urban communities today. Successful urban ministries are typically ran by high capacity leaders who do not intentionally practice leadership development. I can't tell you how many ministries, I'm, I'm getting older, I'll be 50 next year, been in ministry for 26 years, so I'm getting to that age where, you know, you start to see ministries in full bloom. You've seen them when they started, you've seen them when they when they had their peak, and you've seen when they declined. And almost the biggest predictor of a decline in an urban ministry, I can tell you, is when the primary leader who's been very successful, whether it was the founder or someone else, when they leave. When they leave, too often the ministry goes away. And I believe that our urban communities need vibrant leaders within the church because the church fulfills a huge role in being the connective tissue of the community. I think, and this is just my biased opinion, far more than in a sur suburban situation. I really do. And so when an urban community loses a church, when it loses a ministry, it truly leaves a deficit in a hole within the neighborhood. So why is it this way? Well, number one, I think there are too many emerging leaders that are neglected. Now, I have a story in terms of I've helped start two churches. The first church that I tried to start, it was 1,001 things not to do when you plant an urban church. And in that situation, what drove me out of that situation was I was a young buck, about 20, 21, coming up in the ministry, and the person who was over me felt threatened by my skill set. Now, I could see this. In hindsight, now in the time, I didn't see any of this. But in hindsight, I said, oh, I was just wanting to be developed. I was wanting to be invested in. I was wanting things to happen because I felt God was, was calling me to do them. And the person who was over me felt threatened by that. And they didn't do anything to invest in me as a leader. 
Too many have little or no ministry training. 5% of the world's pastors have any type of pastoral ministry training. Did you all know that? The Center for Global Christianity estimates there's between 2.4 and 3.3 million people ministering around the world within churches. And only 5% of them have any other type of pastoral training. I mean, that's, that's shocking. And most of the churches, if you didn't know this, 66% of the world's churches are urban and poor. I don't know if you knew that either. So this is a huge issue in terms of how training people to be leaders within our, our churches and our communities. The third thing is the work of God suffers or dies when the high-capacity leader leaves. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. So these are the, 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 this, to me, this is a major problem that we have that we must address. Now, here's a question that you have to ask yourself, and it's going to be more than rhetorical. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you all to respond with a hand raise, okay? If a bus hits you when you walk out of this building, do you have somebody prepared to take your place right now? Raise your hand if that's the case. One, two, three, four. So about a quarter of you. Who is your bus person? If a bus hits you, it's a morbid way of putting it, right? Probably should find a different illustration, but I don't know. I kind of like getting hit by a bus. It's a sudden thing, right? Nope. Yeah, I'm too urban, right? So, it's a sudden thing. No one is prepared. No one is ready for it. But you, as the leader, have to always have a succession plan in mind. You should be constantly looking for who can I be investing in, in a systemic way, in order for if I go away for whatever reason, this person can step right in and take over and start leading. Okay? And you should always be investing in multiple people like that. Because as you know in ministry, for every two people you invest in, particularly in the urban context, one's going to make it. All right? being real about it. One's going to make it. So you should probably increase your odds and have four, right? <laughs> and I'm not talking about, this is beyond a normal discipleship relationship. I'm talking about, hey, I am going to do things on purpose to try to make you a leader, to help you develop as a leader. You should tell them, I think you have the ability to succeed me one day. And if they go run out of the room, then you know that's not the person, right? But if they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. And just say, hey, listen, I'm going to invest in you. We don't know if God's going to eventually put you in this position, but I'm going to invest in you like he's going to. And it, he may take you and put you somewhere else to lead something else. But I'm going to spend extra time, energy, and effort to be able to do that. So if you don't have a bus person, you have to go back and begin to think about how am I going to put together an intentional system of leadership development so that I can have bus people. All right, so leading towards a legacy, I got this from one of my mentors, that a big thing that you have to do, what are you trying to get these folks to develop and become? You have to get them to go from being an independent producer to what I would call producing others. From star player to coach, it's not what's best for me, but what's best for we. Personal to broad influence, from going to meetings to leading meetings, from individual to collaborative thinking, planning, and decision making, which may be, quite frankly, the hardest thing I find for most urban pastors. Most urban pastors, it's easier if I just do it myself. Well, yeah, it probably is, but it doesn't help you with leadership development. You should never do anything alone. You should never do anything major alone. You should never do it. And from doing the work of the ministry to empowering others, to do the work. That's sort of the path that we have to follow. So, do this in your mind. We don't want you to, to take this test. You know, we're not gonna ask for hands to be raised or anything like that. But as I go down this checklist, put yourself in either an accidental leader or an intentional leader. And this is not bad or good. This is just the type of leader you are in this particular way, okay? Accidental, undisciplined. Again, that's not bad. 
It could be spontaneous. I, I mean, I have aspects of me. Um, I, I joke with my executive team that I like to build a plane while it's in the air. <laughs> Well, where are we going? I don't know. Put gas in it and we'll find out, right? And eventually we'll land. Um, Lone Ranger versus structured and serves as a mentor. Unilateral process for major decision making versus a collaborative process for major decision making. Uncom un uncomplete and incomplete tasks versus tasks that are well planned and are well done. Working harder versus working smarter. Schedule runs you or you run your schedule. Now, the more of this you can do, the more chance that you have that you can actually build a system of leadership development. Again, you can run this and you can be extremely successful, but I don't know if you can have bus people if you operate like this. Because this is an intentional way of operating so that you make sure that you are investing in other folk. So first step, that's you right there, right? You are always looking to identify leaders. Now here's, here is something that you have to understand if you're going to do this, and it's so important, I need you to repeat after me. Y'all ready? No, nope. everybody repeat after me. Everybody, everybody is not a leader. Is not a leader. Just because you like them. No, I'm redundant. <laughs> <laughs> just this. Everybody is not a leader. Well, I like them. That doesn't make them a leader. Well, they work hard. Well, that doesn't make them a leader. Well, it's my cousin. That don't make him a leader. Ooh, you want to really get in trouble? It's my wife. Ooh. Doesn't mean they're a leader. You know, I come from a historical Black Baptist Church, first lady concept, right? De facto. She's my wife, therefore she leads, right? Doesn't necessarily mean they're a leader. And here's another thing. You must play favorites. You do not have unlimited time. And abilities. I know you think you do, but you don't. This is going to sound really, really bad, okay? But I'm going to tell you the story of how I got caller ID back in the day, before everybody just had it, right? Um, I was pastoring a small church in inner city Cincinnati, and I was running ragged, and there were several people who would call me all the time, just take up my time. I know that doesn't happen in y'all's church, right? <laughs> just all the time. Just talk, 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 talk. Take up all your time, energy, and effort. And I finally said, I cannot talk to everybody. So I got caller ID. So when it flashed up, oh, Miss Jones, I can't, can't talk to her. Oh, such and such, oh, I always got time for them, right? You have to play favorites. Jesus played favorites. Do you know that? He talked to the masses. He spent his time with 12, but then he spent his time with three. Who were the three he spent his, most of his time with? Who was it? Peter, James, and John. He did that intentionally. Why did he do that? It was leadership development. He said, I'm not going to neglect. I'm going to speak to the masses. And there are 12 in my crew that I'm going to invest in. Oh, but there are three that I am going to make sure that I spend the most amount of time with them. And you have to have that sort of mindset. Make time to spend with talented individuals. This is who you're looking for in terms of potential leadership. Display personal holiness. Do they live right? I don't care how talented they are. Do they have the fruit of the Spirit? Not that they're perfect, but they have a heart and a desire to want to follow the Lord, to want to mature in their faith. Are, are they people smart? The ability to gather, work well, and motivate people. It's a huge ability. Are they ministry smart? The ability to understand the big picture when it comes to the ministry, okay? Now, what's not up there that you would think might be up there? Yes? Loyalty. Loyalty, Good. What else? High gifting. 
High gifting. What else? What's an obvious one? Obviously, That's availability. Availability. What else? What's, what's one big obvious one that everybody thinks automatically makes people leaders? Education. There you go. Or insert white collar job. Oh, they got a degree. Oh, they work for, who's, who's the big dog around here? Coke? Oh, they work for Coke. Right? Doesn't make them necessarily a leader. It doesn't. And we have to work to not bias ourselves towards who. This is, this is what I would call, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is bare minimum requirements. Okay? Are they people smart? Do they know how to handle people? Are they, I would put loyalty under ministry smart. They're committed to the ministry. They understand the big picture. And they want what's best for the ministry, not necessarily what's best for them. All right? I came up, I told you, in the traditional African-American church. And when I felt like I had to call to preach, the pastor said, okay, for six months, your job is to clean the parking lot and to clean the bathrooms and to count people at the door. It's like that old movie, uh, Karate Kid. Y'all remember Karate Kid? Wax on, wax off. And he's like, I but he didn't tell me the six months part. It's in hindsight, so he just said, oh, you called to preach. Oh, okay, you get here, 7 a.m., um, clean bathrooms, clean parking lot. I'll get back to you. I'm 21 years old. What are we talking about, right? But I did that. And then, those of you who came up in the Baptist church tradition, then I got to do the announcements. That's a big deal, y'all. <laughs> because if you get to do the announcement, that means you get to seat in one of them seats up on stage. <laughs> now, it was the furthest one from the pastor, <laughs> because you got to work your way up. Why are y'all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I got to sit on stage because I got to do announcement. Then I handled that. He kept giving me more and more and more. Then he said, and this is the most stressful part of that traditional uh, Baptist church tradition. He said, okay, you've proven yourself, Minister Sanders, because I'm with the pastor. Yeah, you've proven yourself. Now um, I'm going to call you to preach a sermon, and you're not going to know when it is. You just need to be ready. And then we're going to vote on you. So I, what I do is I wrote my sermon and I taped it to the back of my Bible and kept my Bible with me all the time. So whenever he was ready, I'm like, Psh. And he called me one Sunday, unexpected. I preached. They voted on me right there. Music's playing. They go back in the back. They tally up the votes, come in. Got my ordination certificate. I don't recommend that system, by the way. At least not that part of it. Now, the other parts, I like the humility and all that stuff, but that, man, that, I'm going to call you at any moment. Woo! That's stressful. But that's, that was their system, and they identified me through that. All right. Display self-awareness, the ability to manage themselves well. If this is a person who constantly is causing drama, don't think it's magically going to go away because you invest in them. If they cause drama now, they're going to cause drama as you elevate them. Now, there's a difference between immaturity and drama as well. Some people are just immature. They grow out of it. You'll see it. You'll move forward. But folk who are just constantly causing stuff and different the other, you want to, not saying they're not going to get into heaven. I just want to say you probably don't want them in your leadership development program. Okay, step number two, develop. Embrace the on-the-job training method of Jesus, which was providing relevant experience to constructive feedback. Developing people is three domains. You give them cognitive development, that's the things that you read and you teach them, but then you also give them things to do that help them be able to develop their skill set. Okay? So it's skill set, it's mental development, and it's giving them challenging things to do in order for them to be able to succeed. So Jesus did this. Jesus' Jesus's process was, I do, you watch. Okay? There was a period of that. And there was, I do, you assist, let's talk. Okay? Then it was, you do, I assist, let's talk. Then it was, you do, I watch, let's talk. Then, they were fully developed. Now, timeline, 
It depends on whatever the task was, but this is a constant loop that's consistently happening. You should be constantly thinking about people who you are going to develop. What can I give them to really challenge them to be able to go through this? And then how can I invest them when they do that? You know, when I would preach my sermons, after the sermon, the pastor would sit down with me and we'd go through and we would critique the sermon. What did you do well? What did you do bad? How you need to improve? Things of that nature. When, when I would do uh, leading a, uh, an, an outreach or group event of things of that nature, he talked to me about how did you do that? How did things go? You know, what problems did you have? But it was, that's why you need that extra time with these particular individuals so you can truly invest in them. Step three is empower, right? You truly want to put them in charge of something that matters. Go make me 100 copies. Does that matter? No. Run the outreach event tomorrow. Does that matter? Put them in charge of stuff that matters while you supervise them. The ministry assignment should be something that will challenge them to grow as a leader. Schedule at the very least monthly mentoring times where you can find out his or her needs, objectives, and challenges. And do not step in and save them and do the job for them. You have to be able to let people make their own mistakes. Not fatal mistakes, right? If you see somebody's going to die, well, you probably should step in. But if it's, but if, if people need unmitigated disasters in their life to grow. If we said, what is something you totally completely failed at, but you grew out of that? We can all sit here and we can name things. So people have to be allowed to have mistakes and to grow. And finally, maybe the hardest part, the step number four is to release. He or she is not your mini-me, and she, she or he does not belong to you. They belong to the kingdom. Amen. They belong to God. Amen. Make your own mistakes. We talked about some of the leaders you develop will stay with you, and some God will send away. In fact, it's been my experience that most of the people I've developed, God eventually sent away. All right. So here's just a, a quick uh, diagram will end on this in terms of River of Life Church. That was a church that I pastored in inner city Cincinnati from 2000 to 2007. Here are just some of the people who were success stories because people who present never tell you their failure stories. They only tell you their success stories. All right? But trust me, there's at least double this number of people who I went through, probably triple, to get these successes. So this is a small church in inner city Cincinnati, about 100 people. So we didn't have a whole lot of money. We just followed this sort of program. This is what happened. We had one young man playing at a church in Boston. We had another young lady who, who ended up going to Kosovo, of all places, and leading the orphanage. We had another young man who served as a youth pastor in Cincinnati, another one who served as associate minister in Cincinnati. Um, we had someone who came to our food pantry as a client who now leads our food pantry. Um, youth pastor in Indianapolis and a, in a, one of our associate pastors. But there were many folk who we went through to get these folk who are leading and doing things within the kingdom of God. So, to review, identify, develop, empower, release. That's a system anybody can build within their church and God can breathe on it so that you can have leaders, and you can leave a legacy as you leave. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us for our first ever episode of Empowered. But the conversation doesn't end here. Please reach out to us with comments or topic suggestions at World Impact Inc. for Facebook and Twitter, and World Impact for Instagram. And you can email us at empowered at worldimpact.org. We hope to hear from you.